right? And that's just reminding you about it. Um, viewed this way, it kind of looks as if you can go from, oh, sorry, I, when I wish to point, I keep hitting the wrong button. Um, this way of defining it does make community social capital look as if it is somehow the, the average or the aggregate of individual social capital. So individual social capital is the levels of trust, the group working, the networking, the memberships, the corporations that an individual has with society around them. And then the community social capital in this view of the world is a, a sort of overall measure of how many of these relationships there are within a population. So rather than just focusing on the individual and looking at their relationships, you're looking within the community. So that way of looking at it does seem to suggest um, community social capital could be measured by somehow adding up or combining all the individual uh, social capital. But as I said, there's a question mark whether there's something extra there that's being missed. Please. Okay, right. For an individual, we can think of the level of trust. I trust you very much. I trust you a bit. I don't trust you. So that's a level of trust. Now, if we, we, if we think, imagine sort of beams going out, connecting all our heads, and then you've got a beam coming back this way. You trust me a lot or a little, but we can imagine there's another one across here, and um, you trust a lot or a little. And once we, if you like, take the average of all these connections, an average of the individual levels of trust, we're getting what is being described here as the density of trust. Thank you. Yeah? And, and so the density of trust would be quite low if in our individual relationships we have a low level, but the more we have a higher level, a higher density is developing. I think that's what it's trying to get at. But that view of the world assumes there's nothing else. You know, it's individual trust and we can add it up and we get community, social capital. But sometimes there's a sense that maybe there is more. There's something rather sort of indefinable. And I suggested maybe one way of looking at it and I'll come on in this afternoon's lecture, is think in terms of externalities or spillover effects. And so, and also something called public goods, which I'll be talking about this afternoon. And that's, and that's in economic jargon, would explain why um, community social capital might somehow be bigger than just adding together the individual elements. So, um, there's a real challenge in disentangling the effect of social capital on health. Now, we definitely anticipate there could well be causation from social capital to health. And I've just been running through those four mechanisms that Scheffler believes might be present. But, while that's true, I think there's very good reasons to believe health is likely to influence social capital. And it may well be that um, these different mechanisms that we were looking at, the four mechanisms, um, they may operate synergistically. So if, if two of them are present, you get even more of an impact. If more are present, you're getting stronger impact too. And so it's going to be quite difficult to disentangle the relationship between some change in social capital and a change in health. Partly because that change in social capital is not happening in isolation. 
it may be impacting on the other elements of social capital, and partly because any change in health that seems to come, arise from the change in social capital will also be feeding back in and changing the levels of social capital. And it's going to be really important to try and understand these, um, this rather tangled mess of, um, of effects because you need to understand the, the mechanism by which a change in some form of social capital leads to a change in health. And not just understand the mechanism, you need to be able to some extent quantify that mechanism, quantify the, the size, the strength of relationship, if you're going to design appropriate policies to improve health. Just take a very simplistic economic point of view, there's lots of th ways, I'll talk more about these this afternoon, there's lots of ways we might be able to increase social capital. But if we can't quantify the benefits in terms of improved health, that arise from the change in social capital, how do we know what resources it's worth and what effort it's worth putting in to increasing social capital? So we might be fairly confident if we adopt policies which increase social capital, we'll get better health. But if we're going to make a decision about whether to implement a particular policy, we need quanti quantifiable information on the impact on health. We need to know just, and we need to know how much it costs to increase social capital. But we'll get on to that more this afternoon. Right, here is an example of a um, typical economic approach. Uh, and I, I'm not going to go through it in huge detail, but just enough to give you the sort of flavour of how economists, to some extent health economists, go about it. Economists like, first of all, to start by developing a theoretical model. And a very standard approach in economics is to start with something called a, I must press the green button, a utility function. Now, um, all this is saying, utility here, if you like, is a measure of um, well-being, shall we say. We might call it welfare. Some people might even argue it's almost happiness. Well, I think happiness becomes off sort of rather refined and maybe doesn't quite capture it. But let's call it general well-being. Um, and the utility function is specifying a relationship between the well-being of the individual and the things that improve or diminish that well-being. And so, um, in this case, Folland is started by um, asserting or assuming that individual's well-being or utility is a function of the amount of social capital, their health, health inputs, and X, everything else, all the other goods. So in this way, I'm sure economists are kidding themselves, but they somehow think they're capturing the whole world. <laughs> because they, what have we got here? We've got the well-being of the individual. Um, we've got the social capital that we're particularly trying to identify its impact. We've got health. We've got inputs to health. And we've got everything else. The X, all other goods and services. And the standard approach in economics is to then maximize that utility function, you know, find at what point it reaches a maximum, with respect to a budget constraint. And the budget constraint is simply that your budget has to be greater or equal to the health inputs you're consuming times the price of the health inputs plus X. Now, X doesn't have a price in front of it because to make life simple, we normalize the price to one. So you can imagine, actually, I shouldn't be, I'm, I'm probably doing economics a disservice here, but um, so there's actually a price of all other goods, but we normalize it to one, and so it disappears. And so we have this very simple budget constraint that the, that the amount you spend has to be, or the amount of money you have available to spend 
has to be greater than the amount you spend, and the amount you spend is what's on the right, right hand side. And so you maximize utility, and you're, you're trying to find out in what circumstance will this individual, what combinations of X, C, S, etc., what combinations will give the individual the greatest well being, or sometimes satisfaction, sometimes utility, given their budget constraint? Because, of course, as we increase the budget constraint, we can all consume more health inputs, we can all consume more of other goods, and that will make us better off. Uh, but we, we can't increase our budget constraint, we've got a certain amount available to us. So that's where he starts. He then um, develops some predictions from this simple model. First of all, assuming that the um, health input, C, is a, a health good something that will have a beneficial impact on health. For example, clinic visits. Or it could be medicine or something like that. He then looks at situation where this health input is actually a bad, a health bad. So that could now be um, things like um, tobacco consumption or alcohol or that sort of thing. So that's his underlying model, and he develops some predictions about the relationship between these uh, different elements. He then, in the empirical part of his paper, goes on to look at four, what he calls, healthy risk behaviors. I don't know why he doesn't say health risk, but healthy risk behaviours is how he describes them. And there's four behaviours he looks at. Smoking, um, cocaine use. I should point out S. Folland, Sherman Folland is an American. And this, I think they're a bit more interested in cocaine than the rest of the world is. Um, I don't know why. It might be an interesting soci sociological study why cocaine consumption is high in the US. Anyway, cocaine use, um, inactivity, that's the being too sedentary. I actually, every half hour I should get you all to stand up and then sit down again. It's good for you. It's, re it's really bad just to be sitting there all day, you know that. Anyway, so inactivity, physical inactivity. So he's going to look at that form of behaviour. And the final thing he's looking at is mortality from cirrhosis. Why he's chosen that one? Maybe he just had better data available on it. Um, I'm not sure. But of course, a main driver of cirrhosis, well, probably having unfortunate genetics would be a factor. But the main driver is um, excessive consumption of alcohol, among other things. So those are the four empirical areas he looks at.